put up our theme slide there, please, as we start our finance series. We're starting a, a, a series on generosity, and we're calling it Generous, following Jesus into a life of financial freedom and influence. You serve a generous God, <laughs> and the church is meant to be a generous people, and God has a way for us to be generous people, no matter what our station is in life. And I just wanted us to start with breaking of bread this morning, because when we talk about money in a recession in church on a Sunday morning, some of you just get clothed with fear. Some of you, your butt cheeks get tight, and, and you can physically feel the stress in your body because we're talking about money. And I want you to get a revelation, not of what it is that you need to do or can't do, or perhaps feel like it's impossible for, to, for you to do. But this morning, my heart for you as we start this series is that you may have a revelation of what Jesus Christ has already done for you. We do not have any capacity to live generous lives outside of the generosity of God. Our story is not that we are givers of great gifts, but that we have received the greatest gift that anyone could ever have received. And having received that gift, we get an explosive spiritual capacity to participate in the generosity of God. He fills our hearts with His love. He pours out His blessing through our lives in unusual ways. And He gives us courage to live generously in a world that is going exactly in the opposite direction. Would you say amen? It is for this reason that the scripture directs us to the, the topic of finances as a primary area of discipleship. If you're not a, a follower of Jesus here, we deeply respect whatever your reasons are to, to not yet have made a decision to follow Jesus. And you'll be listening in as we talk about this. We're not preaching this series because we want your money. We're preaching this series because money changes so much about our world and God loves our world. Amen. Money changes the trajectory of families, and God loves families. Money is the reason that people stay married or get divorced, and God loves marriages. Money is the reason that our communities can have schools, can have toilets, can have a better future. Money is the way that we plant churches, that the gospel advances throughout our society. And do you know that in the scripture, there are 2,350 verses concerning money. That's almost twice as many verses as about faith or about prayer. Jesus taught about 15% of his teaching and his parables about money. Why? Because he wants you to give in church? No, because he cares about our lives and because it's impossible to live our lives without serious thought about what it means to be a follower of Jesus in the context of financial giving um, and financial wisdom. Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 24 to 25. The world of the generous gets larger and larger, but the world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. The one who blesses others is abundantly blessed. Those who help others are helped. Isn't it an amazing truth that as we live in a life of generosity, the world of the generous gets larger and larger. But if we choose not to live generously, our world gets smaller and smaller. Paradoxically, if we hold on to what we have and we say, I refuse to open my hand to other people and to the kingdom of God, I refuse to, to, to give. I refuse to live a life of generosity in, in every area of my life. Actually, what happens is your world gets smaller and you end up with less. Paradoxically, even when you feel like you don't have enough for yourself, sometimes you open your hand and your world gets bigger. The world of the generous gets larger and larger, but the world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. Let me ask you some questions. Just uh, You don't have to answer them out loud, but just some diagnostic questions. This will be for you to think about or maybe for people around you that you know. I use these as my own reflections and I hope that you find them um, thought-provoking. Do you have a generous spirit or a stingy spirit? 
I want to ask you, how generous are you in terms of your whole life, in terms of your orientation? Uh, here's some questions that will help you to understand whether you have a generous spirit or, or a stingy spirit. Do you get angry about small things, or is it easy for you to work through frustrations? I was in the queue at the post office the other day. How many of you love um, public services queues? And you know what? I just come prepared. I take a book. I got a water bottle. I got some snacks in my pocket. You know, when you're renewing your driver's license or you're going to home affairs, you need to come prepared. And there's all these people, these Miserable people who got out of bed on the wrong side, who are constantly walking to the front of the queue. I can't believe it. I've been here for 45 minutes. And I'm going, what do you expect to happen? Get over it. How is your complaining going to accelerate what's happening here? You can see no one's, no one's on their lunch break. There's two tellers open and the rest of us are waiting. Just enjoy it. Have a good conversation with the person next to me. I make friends with the people in the queues in home affairs. Uh, when, I went to ho when I went to home affairs just recently, I found somebody in a queue and they were crying. And I went back to the counter and I found out, why is this person crying? And it, they'd sent them a long distance to go and get a document that they didn't actually need. And so I, got, I figured it out and I got the manager involved and I said, can we have another look at this? And we sat in his office for about 25 minutes and took it back to the counter. And I actually provoked an argument between the manager and his own staff, and they sorted it out. And they finally did for this girl who couldn't stick up for herself what they were supposed to do because the person behind the counter was in such a mad, bad mood because she had 200 people who were in a bad mood who were punishing her for things that she didn't do wrong. And so she sent someone else away. Do you know what? If you have a generous spirit, you can be the reason that an atmosphere turns around. Amen. Instead of being frustrated, instead of being angry, instead of punishing everyone for something that no one really can change, be the solution. Is it easy or difficult for you to encourage people affirming what is genuinely good in them? How generous are you with your words? I'm not talking about sucking up to people schmoozing, uh, being insincere, uh, telling people just how, how brilliant they are, how good they are, sincerely believing in the best in them. I said to Tariro, who's part of our kids' church team, I grabbed her this morning and I said, I forgot to send you a voice note last night. I said, when we leave our children with you, like we did yesterday at Growth Track, we left our kids and all of the kids from, growth, who were from the parents of Growth Track with her for about five hours, and I said, you know what the amazing thing is? It's not just giving them fun times and that they're kept safe. I'm actually really grateful that you get to look after our children because I want our children to grow up like you because your dad, Petros, and your mom, Ben Hilda, love Jesus deeply and your family has values that we want reproduced in our family. And we see it as an absolute privilege that we get to leave our children with you because we want them to become like you. That's like a double blessing. Man, when last did you compliment someone and tell them what they're actually really amazing at? What would change in your workplace if you started to have a generous spirit instead of a stingy spirit? Well, if you just went around telling people what they're really great at? What if instead of catching people doing something wrong, you went into your workplace trying to catch everybody doing something right? Hey, that was really amazing. Well done for that. I know that no one noticed that, and in the management meeting, they didn't bring that up, but I saw it. That was really good, and I want you to know that God sees it as well, and if you keep doing it, there's a reward that's actually eternal, and nobody else is going to maybe give you a reward in this life, but I want you to know that God sees you. How long does it take you to forgive people when they've wronged you? This is a tough one, isn't it? You know... I don't think, to be honest, you can, you can forgive someone in your heart. You can really genuinely pray, but it definitely takes some time until you don't feel anger anymore, until you can reference the same event or see that person's profile on Facebook or Instagram or whatever, and you don't feel a sense of anger rising in your heart. It does take time. So with respect to you, if something's fresh, you may still be some months away from actually being able to feel good or being able to even greet somebody, um, don't punish yourself, but keep going with that process. And by the way, if you want to be free from unforgiveness, it's very simple. It's not easy, but it's very simple. You just have to remember how much Jesus forgave you and what you did against Jesus. And when you compare what they did to you 
compared to what you did to Jesus and how he blesses you, that's the place that you get the power from. But I know some people who have been angry with people for 20 years. You know, my life was going really well until Cape Town in 1998. And you're like, 1998, I wasn't even, I wasn't even born yet, you know? I wasn't even born yet. And you know, you know when you have a friend that wherever you go, you know that they're going to tell the same story. And you're like, just whatever you do, just don't bring up Cape Town. In fact, don't show any photos of Cape Town. Don't say, you, even if you like Cape Town, just don't say it. Otherwise, none of us are going to have a good evening because, because it's going to come out. You know, I just want to let you know, you know, like I just want to, I just got to, and then the whole dinner party is all about this story. And they did this to me. And you know, I used to own this property and it was going here and it was all, and just like, oh, get over it, man. There's another blessing coming for you. The losses of your past don't define you. There's a blessing that's bigger in your future. And God's covenant is good enough and big enough that if you'll just let it go, you can move into greater things. But if you're constantly living your life looking in the rearview mirror and binding everyone that's done wrong to you, you never become aware of the generosity of God. Is it exciting for you to use your time to serve other people, or do you feel imposed on? <laughs> Is it exciting for you to serve other people, or do you feel imposed on? Um, our neighbor asked us to look after her cats. I don't, I don't particularly like cats, i got to tell you. I don't even know if they're made by Jesus. I feel like every other animal is made by God, like in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and filled it with animals. And then the devil came and he's like, cats, you know, because <laughs> cats, man, cats are just rude. Cats have their own opinions about everything. Cats have no boundaries. And so when my neighbor offers, she's like, please, we're going away for the Easter weekend. Can you look after our cats? And I'm like, cats, plural, many cats. One cat is too much. Three is a lot. I feel like that's good advice for some grannies. One cat is enough in Jesus' name. And, uh, and anyway, then, then, then the neighbors were complaining about the cats and what they were doing. So now the person who owns the cats is not there. So now the neighbors are coming to complain to me about the cats. And I'm like, listen, I'm also wondering why I'm in it. Why am I in it? Why am I within the cat situation? <laughs> Please. Talk to your people. You, you have cats. They have cats. I'm not supposed to be in it. I just feed the cats. I change the... And so anyway, then we had to lock the windows. We had to go with a whole new plan. And so every morning, I'm now... I, we have to put a litter box. I don't know if you know what a litter box is. It's, 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 it's a glorious thing. It's a, it's a piece of plastic that they put sand in, and it's full of cat poo. And every morning, i got to go and i got to scoop the cat poo out into the garden and refresh the litter. I don't love cats, but my neighbor loves cats. And because I love my, I will love her cats whether I love cats or not. You know what the awesome thing is? Yesterday, we got to invite her daughter to come to church, to come to growth track with us and they hang out. We, and then my daughter says this morning, I would love to bring this little girl to church with us. Can we invite her to come to church with us? Because the world of the generous gets larger and larger, and the world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. And the most powerful thing I could do for this person is not have a long conversation with them about Jesus and about everything that's going on in their life, but I just needed to love their cats. Even if I don't love cats, I will make my world big enough to love cats so that serving people creates a generous witness. Do you get disappointed when people don't express enough appreciation for something or the good you did for them? Okay, we all love giving, and we all love seeing the, the, the smile on someone's face. But you know, sometimes people are just, it just becomes too much. Did you enjoy it? Did you really enjoy it? Was it great? Tell me again. Tell me again. You know? And, and then when you take the, the photographs, you always want to be in the photograph. Why does, it, why does it have to be a selfie? Why don't you just celebrate them doing well? Why do you have to be like, I did it. I was the one who gave it. I, 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 was, the one, I was the one who gave them the lift. 
I was the one who did it. I made it happen. Do you prejudge people in conversations or are you open to them? Even if, you, even if they live a lifestyle you don't agree with or they have a position that you don't understand or they've done things that make you really have a negative attitude towards them, are you still willing to be open to them and open to truth coming from the mouth of a person that's not necessarily truthful? Are you open to people or do you close them off before the conversation even starts? It's the difference between a generous and a stingy spirit. Do you get disappointed when, sorry, do you get offended when people ask for help, ask you for help, or do you take it as a compliment? Someone comes to your desk during the day and, uh, and you're really busy and they say, I need, I need your help with this. What's your first reaction? Go away, man. Or, hey, you know what? I wonder why they're asking me for help. Actually, they might actually think that I'm someone who has something good to contribute to their responsibility and they trust me enough and they believe in my heart enough that I would actually help them. And here's where it gets into our topic. When someone talks about money, do you get tense and nervous or open and expectant? You see, a generous spirit a gener generosity is first nothing to do with money. It's everything to do with the gospel. It's everything to do with believing that Jesus Christ loves us so much that God gave. For God so loved the world that he gave. And his act of generosity melts our hearts. I know some Christians who have been in church for so long, but they've never lived a generous life. I'm actually convinced, having been a pastor for 18 years, that some people got baptized in lemon juice because they are just sour. Just Some people you just meet, they, they are on time for church every week. They, they, they leave just straight after the end of the service. Uh, but they're like, they're like baptized in lemon juice. They just move, move. They just, you know when you drink something and you're just like, what's in that? There was a, there was a person in this, in this church some years ago. We, we were growing, and we were actually, uh, at that point, we were having to put more chairs out, and we were having to create a, a room for people who were coming late, um, uh, because people still come late. Do you go to work late, or is it just church? All right, I'll stop. Let's come back to that later. This is too much for you already, but that's also about generosity, isn't it? Some people go to work late and then leave early. You arrive 45 minutes late for work, and then it's quarter to five, and you already got your lunchbox, your computer's shut down. What's that about? Anyway, we, we, we reserved the last five rows for people who were coming late just because we wanted to be gracious and say, if you come early, come, let's make room. Let's make a good atmosphere in the front. Let's make room for people. And there were students coming in. There were young people coming in. There was a whole lot of people that were filling up the church, and she sat and she said, this is my chair. I always sit in this chair. You should know. Because since the time I came to this church, I've been sitting right here in this chair. And uh, this is what she says to the, to the person who's, who's leading our team. And I watched what was happening. And I said, I said, go and tell her again. It's not about her comfort. Just explain to her. It's, it's more than her comfort. It's about a mission. It's about reaching lost people. It's about creating room for other people. She says, she says I'm, not, I'm not moving. This is my chair. So I go and talk to her, and I say, first of all, please don't be rude to people who serve in this church. By the way, I've never seen you serve anywhere. Okay? But you don't have to serve somewhere. It's a pity because you're missing out on the awesome joy of giving to other people your time. And, but please don't be rude to the people, and please do move. She says, I'm leaving this church, and I'm never coming back. I'm, a, I'm, I'm, I'm sometimes a polite person, um, and, and I'm also a little bit insecure, so I don't always say what I'm, what I'm thinking. But I just smiled and said, okay, and I walked off. But what I was saying in my heart was, good, don't come back. I'm really glad that you're not coming back, because you're taking up room for someone who's hungry for God. You're taking up room for someone else in this church who's got a generous spirit. When they see someone new coming through the door, they want to embrace them. They want to help them. They want to do their best for them. This morning, someone's car broke down, 
And one of our team members said, we're not catching. I said, let's catch a bolt for their family while the other the family members are serving. They said, oh, don't worry, I'll go and drive. I'll go and drive. I'll drive all the way to their neighborhood and I'll pick them up and I'll bring them to church. I would rather have open seats in the house for a generous person to sit in than a stingy person who's, who knows everything about the Bible, doesn't give, doesn't, doesn't pray, doesn't sing, complains about the music, complains about the shortness of the skirts that the girls are wearing, complains about everything, and doesn't want to move from their seat so they can make room for someone who's hungry for God. There are some people who know everything about the Bible and nothing about Jesus. <laughs> And they've been in, in church for years. And so I want to just challenge you today. This is my primary message here today. Is, is Do you have a generous spirit or do you have a stingy spirit? And all of us, before we even talk about money, we are challenged by the gospel to grow in a spirit of generosity. I want to encourage you, wherever you're starting, God wants you to grow in a spirit of generosity. In the way that you talk, in the way that you treat other people, in the way that you smile. And of course, in the way that you deal with your finances. Here's Matthew chapter 6. And I've got three points for you. You still got some time with, uh, together? We're going to do three points from Matthew chapter 6. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Therefore I tell you, Jesus said, do not worry about your life, what you'll eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than Gucci and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more, much more valuable than they? Can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, they're not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. And if that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For pagans run after these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself each day has enough trouble of its own. This is God's word. Three things. I want you to write three things down if you're taking notes. First of all, money follows God's mission. Everybody say mission. That's the most important thing. Money follows mission. Mission doesn't follow money. Money follows God's mission. Number two, motives. Everybody say motives. What do you worship with your wealth? Sorry, that's the third thing. And number, number, the second one is mindset. Mindset. Do you have a mindset of lack or abundance? Everybody say mission. Everybody say mindset. Everybody say motives. In the time we have left together, I want to talk about these three things. The mission that we live by, that determines everything. Our, our mindset, is it a mindset of poverty or a mindset of abundance? And our motives in terms of what we worship. Mission, number one. Here's the key truth here. Money follows God's mission. Money does not follow you when you are chasing money. If you are chasing money, just put it up there again. Money follows mission. Money follows God's mission. 
if you don't, here's the thing about being a follower of Jesus. And again, if you're not a follower of Jesus, you're off the hook. You're just kind of listening into a conversation. But you cannot have a mission. You can't make your own mission. You can only be given a mission that is from God. And we have been given a mission to fill the earth with God's glory. We've been given a mission to proclaim the love and the power of our Lord Jesus Christ in all the earth. We have been given a mission to, sh to create a sustainable and beautiful way of life in which there is such a thing that is possible called human flourishing, where people are treated with justice and righteousness in this life, even though the system isn't changing as fast as we'd like it to change and we'll never get it completely right and the solution won't ultimately be political uh, or social, the solution will be spiritual. At, wherever we have influence over other people, we are to fill the earth with God's glory. I want to tell you something. If you are chasing money, you will never have enough. They asked Rockefeller, how much money does a person need? And he said, just a little bit more. Isn't it true? But if you're chasing the mission of God, God's resources follow you. I want to ask you a primary question about money. And we're going to talk very practically about debt. We're going to talk about budgeting. We're going to talk about faith. We're going to talk about the tithe. All of these practical things will come in, in times uh, to come. But the, the primary thing that we're meant to be doing is saying, God, I want you through my life to express your generosity to others. That's the mission. That's the mission. When you come to my house, I may not be able to offer you Coke, but I may be able to offer you a glass of Oros. And I'll do it in a clean glass because I'm generous. And I'll pre-prepare the water and make it cold because I'm generous. And I'll put it on a tray because I'm excellent. And I'll wipe under the tray on the table before I serve it to you because I'm a generous person and I serve a generous God. You see, we've mistaken generosity with a certain level. But excellence is doing the best with what you have. And if your mission is to show the generosity of God, show the glory of God in the earth, God will always send resources your way. I love this uh, framework from Chris Matibula. I just think these three words are so helpful for us as we think about resource. There's three levels. There's the level of survival. Do you know that we all uh, can live, it's possible to live from a level of survival. Survival says this, I just want to have enough money for school fees. I just want to make it to the end of the month. Uh, you know what it's like when you have more months than you have money. And you really start to pray about the, about the 13th if you get paid on the 15th or about the 20th if you get paid on the 25th. And you're just praying. Has anyone prayed recently for their petrol gauge? And you see it going down there and just like, in the name of Jesus... In the name of Jesus. You even lean to the right, just in case. Just in case it goes, it goes up there to the right. And, and we, we live in this place called survival. And, and, you know, the amazing thing is, God has this way, when you come into covenant with him, he increases you. And so you start by saying, I, I wish I could just pay school fees. And then you start by saying, you know what, I think I want to send my kids to a different school. Isn't that wonderful? I can send my kids to a school where they're getting a different quality of education. I even have some money for extracurricular activities. Isn't that wonderful? And we can say that that's success. Is there anyone that doesn't want the best for their children? Let's put up that word that's called success. Is there anyone that doesn't want their children to succeed? Just put it up there on the screen. Is there anyone that wants success, not just for you, but for the next generation? You want success. And so there's nothing wrong with wanting to be successful. But so many people who are followers of Jesus, we stop there at the success level. And there's another level that God wants us to live at. That's the level of generosity called significance. And significance says this. Significance says, now I'm not just struggling to pay school fees. And I'm, I'm actually able to send my children to a good school and pay for extracurricular. Now I'm trusting God that I would be able to send another kid through school that doesn't have money to attend school in the first place. Now I'm going to be part of a scholarship fund. 
now I'm going to get some friends together and let's take a, a girl child who hasn't had a good education and we're going to give her the best possible opportunity because I've got four or five friends who have gone up through a level of success and, and it's going to cost us less than you know, 6 or 7% of our income and together we can change the trajectory of someone else's life. That's the greater blessing, isn't it? Yeah, that's clap worthy. In... Uh, in June, we're going to Zitulele. We've been invited. You can just uh, throw a photo up there. There's a, there's a community called Zitulele just below um, Randuli, south of Mtata. And uh, a hospital was started there in colonial times and has recently been taken over by an incredible team that has built it up. There's educational work happening there. There's neonatal care. They do things with free glasses. There's a church happening there. And we've got a friend uh, from Cape Town who's recently taken over as the principal of the primary school and she's asking us to come alongside her to send a mission team to help them with cross-cultural learning in their school to help them and resource them and we're going to take a learning team we're going to uh, carefully choose people and see where we can make a difference because our church needs to be in a place where we are always having an outlet we always have a place of giving we always have a place of mission we always have something that stretches us and says even when we feel like we don't have enough for here we have to trust God that there's a not, a, not just enough for here, there's enough for there, and there's enough for here. And the amazing thing is, when you choose significance, there's always enough for here, because God loves the resources to flow. And so I want you to start praying about Zitulele. The gospel needs to go forward. The, the church cannot be in a survival or a success mode. We need to be looking for significance. So I want to ask you, before you start thinking about money, what's your mission? Seriously, what's your mission? If you don't have a clear mission, you can be captured by an offer that's just money. Jesus said that one of the most horrible things that can happen to you, this is what this passage is about, is when you end up serving money as your master. Money is a wonderful servant, isn't it? But it's a terrible master. I was, I was working in a, a, a church, my first assignment in a church. I, I was a very strange person. I had hair down, halfway down my back. I didn't wear any shoes um, everybody thought that I sold weed because I just looked like I smoked weed and sold weed. But I actually loved Jesus. I didn't look like I loved Jesus, but I did love Jesus. And I was just carrying on. I was just, just, just cracking away in the church. I think my first salary, my first salary was 2,800 rand. And I still don't know how I made it work because we were feeding someone who lived in our house from Zimbabwe and we were paying for him to go for his books and his, his living expenses and his rent. And somehow... God blessed my, my friend uh, Lee Garakara from, uh, from Zambia and myself to send this guy Twande through school. I still don't know how it happened. It was a miracle of God. And we were just, you know, you know, sometimes you have much less money than you used to have, but you were much more happy because you had more faith. Do you know what I'm talking about? Now you have more resources and you have more problems in managing them. You know what that's about? And so, so this is the condition of my life. And I, I, went, I was asked to go and preach somewhere. And I just asked my leaders, I said, do you think this is a good idea? Do you want me to go do this? They said, yeah, if you want to go, you can go. So I said, that's cool. I go wherever everybody's happy for me to go. I'm not looking for anything. I didn't realize that it was actually a low-key job interview and that they were trying to get me to come and take over leading the church. And it was, it was a vibrant church. It was healthy. They had a good vision. But this guy said one thing. It was a terrible mistake to me. He said, you know what, if you come and, and lead this church for us, you're going to have a better salary than where, you, when you, where you're actually working right now. And um, I was 22 or something, and I just smiled, and I, I left it alone, and I never came back to him. But what happened in my heart was I said, you don't know the first thing that motivates me. You have no idea what my mission is. How dare you insult me? by offering me more money to step out of the purposes of God for my life. Come on, somebody. How dare you diminish the vision that I have for my life to the level of a salary package? How dare you offer me second best that tastes better than what's really good for my life? Don't ever settle 
for stepping out of your purposes because you're chasing money. The first question about money is mission. What are you living for? Do you know what? Even if you don't have a job right now, even if you feel like you don't have enough resources, I want to, I want to encourage somebody. I want to stir somebody today. If there's a dream in your heart, you start it right now with nothing. Start it today with nothing. Go home and open a, a document on your phone that says, my vision document, my dream document. This is what God has put in my heart. Start writing it down. Start putting it forward. There's Angie at the back. She's celebrating. She just built a house for her mom with, with, with something that she didn't think she could do it. God bless you, Angie. And we see your faith. If there's something in your heart, Start doing it with nothing because God can do something with nothing. He created the universe from nothing. And we are meant to be people who live in a dispensation where God can do impossible things from nothing. But if we're sitting waiting for money, we'll never, we'll never get what God has put in our hearts. You've got to step out of the boat. You've got to step out of the boat. You've got to take a risk. You've got to put something in God's hands. When Peter was called by Jesus, the, 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 the water was there. And he saw Jesus walking on the water. The crazy thing about that story is not that Jesus walked on water. And I know if you're not a follower of Jesus, that's crazy in itself. But he was raised from the dead. So we'll let him do other things like that as well, right? Jesus is walking on the water. That's not the crazy thing about that story. The crazy thing about that story is that Peter looked at Jesus and said, that looks like fun. Do you know when we follow Jesus, there are things that just are creative ideas in our minds, in our hearts. And we have this instant reaction. You're not praying about it. But you just see an opportunity, maybe in, in business, in a market, maybe in education, maybe it's a, a smartphone app, and you just have a creative idea, and you just think to yourself, that looks like fun. I want to ask you, what is it that's stirring in your heart where you just say, that looks like fun? Maybe you haven't realized that that's the voice of Jesus calling you to do something great in this world. That looks like fun. That looks interesting. I'm curious about that. I think that could make a difference in this world. I think that could bless somebody. That looks like fun. Peter looks at Jesus walking on the water, and he says, that looks like fun. Here's a Simba Rashe in the, in the middle row. He's actually baked some scones that we're selling after the service. For 15 bucks at the end of the service, you can buy a scone and a cup of tea or a scone and a cup of coffee. Isn't that great? Really great. And uh, by the way, every woman in this house who is single should marry somebody who bakes scones like Simba Rashe in Jesus' name. Relationship goals, hashtag relationship goals. Simba was working for, he was working in an, an orga, a, a volunteer tutoring organization, and he noticed these people are really passionate. I'm sorry if I messed your story up. He noticed these people are really passionate, so he started to take notes. Why are all these people willing to give their time generously to volunteer? So he started asking them questions, and he started writing down their response. And because he's an analytical person, he knows how to do research, he has a master's degree in um, microbiology, analytical mind, starts recording in, in, in good scientific ways, doing good research about why people want to volunteer, just for fun, just because he's curious. He looks at the water and he goes, that looks like fun, and starts collating that. And then he says, he says to himself, I've always wanted to visit Durban. I've never visited Durban. And so he sees on the internet there's an advert for a conference for abstracts about volunteer organizations of this kind. So he says to himself, I, I know how to do academic research, and I have the data already. Let me just write a paper about why people volunteer. He writes the paper. They invite him to the conference to present his paper. He gets a free trip to Durban. This is Peter just looking at the water and going, that looks like fun. That looks like fun. I, I'm going here in a little bit, of, a little bit next week. But you see, we're talking. I'm talking about someone who's mastered something. When you've mastered a skill, God can use you to be a blessing. God can open doors for you. If you're not prepared to upskill yourself and to master something, God can't use you for anything. And here's the crazy thing: you just, you just see something that looks like it's possible or impossible in this case, Peter looks at the water and he doesn't look down at the water. He just looks at Jesus and he says, Jesus, if it's you, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come and I'll come. Some of you are sitting on ideas that look impossible and we need impossible in the Eastern Cape. Some of you are sitting pregnant 
with an idea for a business and it looks impossible. And I want to tell you, we need impossible right now. Some of you are, are, are thinking about another level for the organization that you're responsible. And I want to tell you, that level is needed right now. It's needed. It's from God. Just because he's not speaking to you in the God voice doesn't mean that he's not inspiring you to step out in faith. And Peter doesn't look at the circumstances. Come on, somebody. He looks at a generous God. He looks at a God who can do anything. He looks at a God who made the universe from nothing. He looks him in the eyes and he says, God, if it's you, come. Tell me to come. Tell me to come and I'll come. And he steps out on the water and the laws of physics change under his foot. I want to I want to I want to say to some of you some of you are going to walk on water some of you to live in the purposes of God for this for this continent in this region in 2023 you're going to walk on water the laws are going to change the laws are going to change there are economic laws that govern our country there are economic laws that govern our our, our world, but actually those are all underpinned by spiritual laws where there's a kingdom of darkness, of greed, where people are mastered by money. But if you will decide that money is not your master, but Jesus is your savior and he is your master, if you will stop following and chasing money and you will follow him, the laws will change for you. You will live by a different law. You will live by a law that brings in prosperity into the Eastern Cape. You will live by a law that brings in a blessing into the Eastern Cape. You will live by a law where what you are responsible for will be blessed and advanced in Jesus' name. Do you know it says of, of Joseph that when he was in prison, everybody got blessed in the prison. He was in part of his household. He was a manager and part of his household was so blessed because God was with him. They accused him falsely, which was the devil's strategy to bring him down. He got thrown in prison and the prison got blessed. And because he was willing to be a blessing in the prison, he went from the prison back to the palace. And this time, that same man, Potiphar, remembered him to Pharaoh probably and said, this guy was actually really faithful in my house. And F Joseph goes from being just an average guy running the prison. He goes from being the prison warden. How weird is this? They gave a prisoner the responsibility of being the prison warden. He goes from being a prison warden to being the prime minister of Egypt and saving a whole nation from seven years of famine. If you will just believe that God is a generous God, that God is a good God, that the laws of physics can change around you, the laws that govern everybody else don't have to apply to you, you can enter into a big world. My time is gone. I want to ask you to stand to your feet. If you believe what I'm saying, I want you just to begin to cry out to God and to ask him, to pour out his spirit, a spirit of abundance, a spirit of faith, a spirit of advancing, a spirit that says, I serve a God who is more than enough. I don't serve a God of lack. I serve a God of abundance. I don't worship what the people around me worship. I worship God. I don't worship money. I worship with my money. Would you just offer yourself to him right now? I want to invite you to just picture everything that's under your care. By that I mean all of your all of your your resources, everything that you have. And I'm talking also, I'm asking you to look inside all of the resources that you have inside of you. Your education, your emotional resources, the experience that you have, the languages that you speak the relationships that you have, your whole life, and including that, if you're working, your place of work, just get that in your mind. If you're not working, I want you to imagine the kind of job that you believe you can make a difference in. Imagine that right now in faith. You don't yet have it, but you can imagine it right now. 
And something very powerful happens when we take everything that we are and we offer it to God. When the Israelites took a, a sheep or a, or a goat or a bull or a pigeon or a loaf of bread and they offered it to the priests, the priests would take that and they would put it on the altar and the fire of God would fall and receive that sacrifice. The fire of God always falls on sacrifice. Whatever we offer for God's glory, He will fill it with the fire of His glory. He will advance it. He can change things in miraculous ways. Perhaps you've been looking down on your ordinary life. Perhaps you've been saying, I don't actually have enough. I live in lack and I'm struggling and I'm scared and I don't know what to do about it. I feel like I can't move forward. I want you in faith right now to just hold both of your hands in front of you as if you're holding all of this, your life. Just as your eyes are closed, hold it in front of you. And would you just, would you just offer it to God right now? Maybe you want to open the palms of your hands and say, I'm not holding this tightly anymore. I'm giving it to you. I'm offering it to you. I'm offering it to you. surrender to you everything I give to you we're holding nothing we're holding nothing let's join him I surrender I surrender to you everything lord everything i give to you we're holding nothing we're holding nothing we're holding nothing we're ho this is so powerful let's sing it again nothing we're holding nothing but i surrender I surrender to you, everything, Lord, everything I give to you. We're holding nothing, 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 we're holding nothing. We're holding nothing, Lord. We're holding nothing. I give myself. I give myself away. Yeah. I give myself away. So you may use me. One more time. I give myself away. I give myself away. But I give myself away, I give myself away, so you may use me. Jesus has withheld nothing from us. Come on, let's offer ourselves to God. Just pray for your ordinary life. Dedicate it to Jesus. Believe that the best is yet to come. Believe that your future is absolutely wonderful. As he has withheld nothing, nothing, nothing. He withholds nothing from us. Withhold nothing from him. Offer yourselves to him. Offer, offer your life to him. Now, God, let your fire fall on the sacrifice that is offered by your people. Let your glory fall on what we offer you today. Let the power of God be felt in every home, in every household. Let the prosperity of the kingdom of God follow this offering now in Jesus' name. Let these prayers that are prayed result in in things that lift up the community around us. We refuse to be in survival mode. We refuse to settle for success. 
We choose significance in Jesus' name. We offer you everything that we are to produce a life of significant influence in the kingdom of God, that others will be blessed, that others will have hope, that others will know God, that others will experience justice and righteousness in this lifetime in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. I hope you're going to come back next week with a friend. That's also part of generosity. Invite someone to the house of God.